Hi guys and girls, I'm Reef Man, and this is all about the clownfish. So there are about 30 species of clownfish. They're spread out into two different genuses, all in the same family. So we have the Premnus genus, which is only one species, the maroon clownfish. And then all of the rest of the clownfish are in Amphiprion, which includes all of the common clownfish that you would keep in your tank. Things like the tomato clown, uh, the Ocellaris, Percula, those are the two most common by far clownfish that we keep. They're all in the Amphiprion genus. Amphiprion percula is identified by 10 dorsal spines on the fin, while Ocellaris has 11. So if we look at the fin of my clownfish here, we could count them, or try to at least, and you'd be able to identify the species. Now, keep in mind that a lot of times what you buy in the pet store for clownfish are actually hybrids because there's a lot of selective breeding going on to get special banding. The traditional clownfish just has three bands um, across its body and they're all solid. They don't intermix. There's just three bands of white um, and then an orange background. Obviously in breeding, they've created all manner of stripes that merge and combine and are spotted and all sorts of things. Um, so these are going to be harder to identify on a species level because they're really a, probably a mix of the two species at some point, or at least very selective breeding. So both Percula and Ocellaris were both identified first in the 1800s, I think 1802 for Percula and Ocellaris in 1830. Both of them were identified by French natu naturalists. Uh, Ocellaris was identified by Cuvier, and he is notable because he's also the father of, of modern paleontology. There are no clownfish in the Atlantic Ocean. They're all Pacific fish, and they are widespread throughout the entire Pacific. Although, depending on the species, the individual species might be only found in a small part of the Pacific Ocean. Because clownfish are so widespread and so common, especially Percula and Ocellaris, they are a great beginner species for your home saltwater tank. They take just normal temperatures, nothing special, upper 70s, low 80s is fine, and normal salinities. And they are going to be very forgiving to maybe not the most amazing water quality. They eat almost anything that you can put in the tank between flakes, pellets, frozen food. If you can get it in your fish tank and it's the appropriately sized piece, your clownfish will probably eat it and do just fine. They are also damselfish. They're in that family of fish and they are quite territorial as reef fish go. They are more than willing to bite you when you put your hand in the tank if you're in their area, and they will certainly fend off their anemone or um, whatever it might be to uh, other fish. All clownfish are actually born male, and as they grow, if they're the dominant fish, they turn female, which means that if you go to your local fish store and you buy two very small immature clownfish, one of them will become the dominant one and become larger than the other. And that larger one is going to be the female. In the wild, they pair up and then they live for the rest of their life as that pair. And they might live in an anemone. In the wild, clownfish are found in anemones and they will be a main pair of clownfish in the anemone. There might be other subordinate clownfish in that group, but they are not mature, they don't breed. And no one really knows why these other clownfish don't just go out on their own to somewhere else where they can you know, meet another clownfish and start their own group. Um, the theory, at least, though, is that if you're in a group and you're not the um, dominant fish, eventually that dominant fish is going to get eaten or die, and then you can move up a level and so on, and eventually you are the dominant fish in that anemone. But it's not been proven, and no one really knows why clownfish do this behavior. So it's an interesting study opportunity for someone. As I mentioned, clownfish in the wild and in your tank like to host anemones. In our tank, they most often are going to host bubble tip anemones. That's the most common kind of anemone that we have. Um, but they'll host all sorts of other things. They'll host the corner of your tank, your power heads, your heater, your uh, you know, allergy scraper, all sorts of things in your tank can be hosted by uh, a clownfish. In the wild though, there are two kinds of anemones that they actually prefer to host. This Heteractus magnifica, which is the magnificent sea anemone, and the Psychodactylia gigantea. 
which is the giant carpet anemone. Those are the two kinds of anemones, the only two, that clownfish are commonly found in in the wild. Nobody really knows exactly how clownfish survive the sting of the anemone. There are a bunch of theories though. The two leading theories is that they've just evolved to resist the sting and they, they do get stung, but it doesn't hurt them. Um, the other theory, and I think maybe a little bit more likely, is that the slime coat of clownfish is actually sugar-based instead of protein-based. And that makes the anemone not see the clownfish as food because it rubs up against it, it detects sh sugar and slime made out of sugars uh, instead of slime made out of protein. And you know, you'd expect a fish is made out of protein and muscle, so, uh, so an anemone would go the same route and not sting something that it doesn't think is food. They have done tests where they remove the slime coat of a clownfish and then put it into a tank with an anemone. When it goes into the anemone, the anemone eats the fish. So there's definitely something to the slime coat, although there's not been enough research done to really nail down exactly what it is about the clownfish slime coat that protects them from their anemones. Clownfish are one of the few fish that you can reliably breed on your own in your home aquarium. If you have a pair and you're taking good care of them, so you know, feeding them regularly good water quality, eventually they will lay eggs and those eggs will hatch. And it's just up to you whether you want to pull those eggs out and raise them uh, on your own or not. And that's why clownfish are really uh, one of the original captive bred fish that you can get for your tank. The clownfish in my tank are captive bred. Um, they're not wild caught. And I think the more that we can do captive breeding programs, uh, the better off. We, we breed a lot of daddy backs, a lot of gobies. I'm starting to get some pygmy angelfish, those kinds of things, captive bred. But clownfish really started it all. If you're interested in trying your hand at marine fish breeding, the first one to start with is really going to be the clownfish. The eggs hatch after uh, a few days. I think it's four to seven days after they're laid. And if you say put a ceramic tile in the tank near where the clownfish are, they're likely to lay the eggs on that tile. Then you can remove them from the tank, take them off into your uh, tank that you're gonna raise the larva. And the trick is really being able to feed them. So there are other fish, like I mentioned, angelfish, um, all sorts of things that will breed in the tank. And that's not the hard part. The hard part is getting the newly hatched larva to survive. So you'll have to grow some algae cultures um, copepods, uh, things like that, to be able to feed these brand new tiny little fish larvae. And then after a week or two, they're big enough to eat newly hatched brine shrimp, um, things like that. They kind of, you know, as they grow, they can take bigger and bigger things. But it's just those first few days, the first couple weeks, that really is the difficult part for clownfish. Um, if you're interested, there is a whole bunch of resources out there on raising larval clownfish. And really the hard part really is just having the food for them. So if you think that's something that you would be interested in doing, I really encourage you to go out and, and look at how to do that. There's a wealth of information out on the internet. So hope this was interesting. I think just about all of you probably have had clownfish or do have clownfish in your tank. I'd be curious to know if I missed anything, things that are interesting about the clownfish that you have. There's all different kinds of species. Um, I've only ever had uh, maroon clownfish um, and then Ocellaris and Percula, but there's all sorts of other kinds of clownfish out there as well, and they're all similarly easy to keep. So, yeah, till next time, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Bye.